Oh, hey everyone. Oh. Today we're going to talk about pain-free running. This is going to be part one in a series. Today we're going to mostly discuss why runners get injured and then give a few uh, strategies to avoid further injuries, but those, those strategies will be further discussed in uh, later videos. So first off, I want to start this by saying that running is a very good thing. Um, it has a very low barrier to entry. Every, almost everyone can do it. It doesn't require really much equipment or at all if you want a barefoot run. Um, it, it has a lot of health benefits. You can use it to lose weight. You can use it to just get healthier in general. You can use it to improve your, improve your cardiovascular capacity. It, uh, it, you can compete in it if you need a competitive outlet. Um, but for whatever reason, running has a very, very high injury rate compared to other ways of exercising. So if we look at some other things, so if you look at uh, weight training, um, Olympic lifting, bodybuilding, strongman, powerlifting, all these things have around two to four injuries per 1,000 hours of training. If you look at the literature um, that has been done on training, training injuries in, in those sports. Uh, even with, with things like CrossFit, it's only around two to three injuries per thousand hours of actual training. If you look at swimming, so competitive swimming, it has around two, two injuries per thousand hours of training. Mountain biking, which we kind of think of as a, uh, generally a fairly, fairly dangerous sport, you're going downhill rapidly, um, sometimes uncontrolled, has about 0.6 injuries per thousand hours of mountain biking, so very, very low. Running in novice runners, there's studies, there's a lot of studies looking at injury rate, it goes anywhere from around uh, three injuries per thousand hours of running in short, short distance track athletes, and then it rapidly increases up to 33 injuries per thousand hours of running in uh, novice runners just getting into the sport. Um, and anywhere in between, most, most studies show at least around a 20% injury rate with whatever population they're using. Higher in new runners, low, a little bit lower in uh, more experienced runners, and then it kind of curves up again for more elite runners. But novice runners in particular have very, very high injury rates. And injury is one of those things that's gonna stop people from running, and then they're gonna lose out on the health benefits of that activity. So we wanna figure out, first, why do people get hurt running? Why does it have such a high injury rate compared to other ways of exercising? So we have a lot of research at looking at this, um, all the way back to the late 1970s, probably earlier, I just couldn't find it because it's not on the internet, looking at every factor you can think of. Looking at running form, we have, if you're into like pose running, chi running, we have studies comparing those. We have uh, research looking at foot strike, forefoot, midfoot, rear foot. We have individual joint mechanics, where your hips are, where your, backs are, where your back is, where your knee is, uh, what your ankle's doing, what your foot's doing, pronation versus uh, an, like anti-pronation. Anti um, we have research looking at footwear, what kinds of shoes, so same, same idea, like really stable shoes, really fluffy shoes, uh, minimalist shoes, no shoes at all, barefoot running. We have research looking at progressions, so how fast should we progress running, um, where should we start with running, like how, just basically how, how quickly should we do this, how far should we run, at what volume of running do we start to injure ourselves. We have research looking at BMI, body mass index, um, so looking at people who might be considered overweight or obese versus people who are underweight or people who are more normal weight, uh, quote unquote. And it turns out for almost every single study that we have saying one, one factor is important, we have another one saying that factor is not actually important or beneficial. So one good example of this is there's a, there's a study saying, looking at, a, there are a few studies looking at pronation, which is your foot kind of turning in like this as you run. Some, there's one study that says this may be a, uh, Overpronating may put you at a higher risk for injury. There's another study specifically saying overpronators had a lower injury rate and it actually may be protective against injury. And so we have to dig into those studies and kind of figure out what's going on there. Um, another one is BMI. So we have studies looking at people who might be considered obese and that in these studies it shows they might be at a higher injury risk for uh, when they're running. But we have another study showing that people who are overweight, the with a BMI of over 26, might actually that might actually be protective against injury when running, um, and so all these contradictory studies. And so the the picture that we get is a very unclear one. It's kind of frustrating trying to make sense of how do we avoid running injuries, and this might be partially why we continue to have these high injuries. So I do think there are some things that stick out that it, we can basically boil it down to. It's these factors. Um, First off, for any injury in any sport, in any activity, the two things that are gonna matter most are probably your training history and your specific load tolerance. So your training history is going to include things like 
Did you play sports when you were a kid? What kind of sports you played? How long have you been training in the activity you're doing? How intensely do you do it? Uh, have you, if you're, if you're running, have you lifted weights? Are you lifting weights? Um, if you've played ball sports growing up, so uh, things where like basketball, football, like axially loaded sports, your bones are probably a little bit more dense. You're less likely to experience a bone stress injury. Um, if, uh, on the other hand, if you were a swimmer and uh, you get into running for the first time, if you're a competitive swimmer getting into running, you might actually be at a higher risk of injury because your cardiovascular system is well developed, but your bones have not been exposed to the impact of running. So the training history really, really matters, and that plays into the load tolerance. So these, these various factors such as training history, genetics, um, your weight, all these things, based, and, and where, you're, where you tend to be strong in your body, how you run, the form you use, um, puts a certain amount of load through your various tissues and body parts, and then we need to, and then you basically end up discovering which part of your body can tolerate the load you're putting through it, and the parts that can't tolerate the load and cannot adapt quickly enough to the load you're putting through them might become injured and you might experience pain with those. So training history, load tolerance. That's not different from any other activity. It's not specific to running. What is specific to running is that running is an impact activity. So um, when you're lifting weights, the, you know, you might, you'd have to lift very, very heavy to get twice your body weight going through any of your joints. When you're mountain biking, when you're swimming, you're not hitting anything. You're, you're having relatively low forces going through your body. When you're running, every time you hit the ground, it's a, it's a fast deceleration. So you can kind of think of the idea of you're in a car and you're driving 60 miles per hour and you go to slow down. If you slow down over 10 seconds, you kind of gently tap the brake and you start to slow down. You don't really experience a lot of force. You barely notice the slowing down um, from 60 to zero miles per hour. If you're in a car and you slam on the brakes, say there's a wreck in front of you and you slam on the brakes to avoid it, um, you get thrown forward, everything in your car goes forward, hits the windshield. There are very high forces at work depending on the speed of how quickly, um, of how quickly you decelerate. And so every time you run, you're, smacking, you're smashing your body into the ground over and over and over and over. You're having a fast deceleration and that results in very high forces. For, so for even slow joggers, most, most slow runners will experience at least two times their body weight going through each leg every time they hit the ground. And it's for a very, a very brief moment, but it's still a high force. Um, and then we have research looking at up to elite sprinters who might experience five and a half times their body weight with every single step. That's a lot of force. And so um, that puts a lot of stress through our musculoskeletal system. And in order to get the beneficial adaptations of running, we end up uh, putting more stress through our musculoskeletal system than I think we realize um, in order to get more fitter, improve our endurance, or lose weight. So the other half of this is that for some reason our nervous system uh, seems to underinterpret the forces that we experience when we're running. So this gets a little bit into pain science and fatigue science. Um, basically what it boils down to is we interpret things, when we interpret things as a threat, when our brain collects information from our body, gets signals from our body about what's happening from multiple sources in our body, then it puts it in the context of the situation of what we're doing, the activity we're doing, our past experiences, all these things. It takes all this evidence and then asks, is there a threat to my body based on all the stuff I'm gathering? And if the brain decides there is, it's going to create pain to make you stop doing it. So it makes you not want to do that threatening thing, whatever your brain is interpreting as a threat. And fatigue works similarly in that it's, it's, there's inputs coming from different sources. This might be fuel sources in your body. Um, it might be the rate of how quickly you're burning energy. It might be your uh, body temperature is a big one. Um, the hotter your body temperature, the more your brain is likely to interpret things as fatiguing. But what it boils down to is your brain is taking input from your body and deciding, hey, this is really hard, I'm starting to get tired, and it's trying to protect you from damaging yourself by stopping you before you get there. And with running, what, it, what seems to happen is that we don't interpret these high forces as as much of a threat as maybe we should. Um, and this, this might boil down to a few different reasons. There's research looking at runners versus uh, lifters in regards to pain thresholds, and runners are able to tolerate more pain once they start to experience it than uh, lifters are able to. Lifters have a higher actual pain threshold. They don't start to experience pain until a higher stimulus, but runners will be able to experience that stimulus for longer before they decide, I'm not gonna tolerate this anymore. Um, so one is that like ability to endure pain um, tends to be a little bit higher in endurance, endurance athletes. The other factor is that exercise in general, and specifically endurance exercise, makes you less likely to interpret things as a threat and less likely to feel pain when and after you're doing the exercise. 
So um, there, there are studies looking at applying a noxious stimulus to people, so putting like pressure on their finger or uh, temperature stimulation. And when you're, when you're doing exercise in general, um, you tend to not interpret it as painful for longer than you would if you were just sitting in a chair. So you'll be able to tolerate more stimulus before it becomes something that you notice and experience pain with than if you were just like sitting down, laying down, experiencing that same thing. So we have these factors that basically make you, your brain less sensitive to the mechanical forces going through your body. So you're less likely to interpret them as a threat. And then due to the nature of running, those mechanical forces are actually really high in your musculoskeletal system compared to like your cardiovascular system for most, most runners, especially for novice runners. Um, and so these two factors by themselves probably elevate that injury risk for running a lot higher than other non-impact activities and non-cardiovascular activities. So we're gonna talk about this more in the, the next video, but basically what we, the most important thing here is probably the appropriate progressions and appropriate accessory work to keep our body strong. So if you progress running too quickly, if you, if you go out and you're like, I'm gonna start running, two miles doesn't seem like a lot, I'm gonna do that four times this week, that may actually be too much. And so the other thing is the speed of running too. If you go out and you run two miles really, really fast and you're exhausted at the end of every one of those runs relatively fast for yourself, and your, your perceived effort is very, very high, you're probably going too hard to start running and you're gonna be at a much higher uh, risk of injury. So appropriate progression, running slower than you think you need to, running less than you think you need to, maybe using time as like I'm running for time instead of mileage might not be a bad idea. And then adding in some strength training as early as you can because strength training is going to help increase your musculoskeletal system's capacity to deal with load. Um, running will do that by itself, but it tends to take a while and anything you can do on top of that to help it out is going to uh, put you at less risk of injury. So next time we're gonna talk a little bit more about how exactly to progress, progress your training volume, um, a few different concepts that are looking to be useful for running coming from other sports, and uh, we'll see where we go from there.